and of course the pulmonary art, the four pulmonary veins draining into the left side of the heart into the left atria. <clears throat> so very basic terms of circulatory system. Now, the amount of oxygen in the lungs is decreased. Therefore, there's vasoconstriction. Therefore, it's harder for the blood to get into the lungs. Therefore, the pressure here increases. Increased pressure in the pulmonary artery. That means... <clears throat> The right ventricle here must work harder to pump the blood through the lungs and the pulmonary artery. That increases its workload, causing hypertrophy and ultimately failure. When right ventricular failure becomes established, secondary to the hypertrophy, it means that when the ventricle is contracted, not all of the blood will have been able to eject it. There will be a backlog because it's working inefficiently. And that, of course, means that the blood that would normally go in from the atria, there will be a backlog there as well. That means there will be a backlog in the, um, in the vena cava. We're getting right, right heart failure causing this systemic vein congestion. This, of course, will damp back all the way, and it means blood won't be able to drain from the body properly. That'll increase the pressure of the blood in the capillaries of the body, and that will result in reduced fluid reabsorption and systemic edema. So core pulmonale, right heart failure, secondary to lung disease, being brought about by this mechanism. So we've considered the features of bronchitis, the narrowing and scarring of the bronchial passages and the inflammation of them. And we've considered core pulmonale, which is heart failure secondary to chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Let's now go on and consider the nature of emphysema itself. Emphysema, remember, is the destruction of the alveolar walls, resulting in loss of elasticity and loss of alveolar surface area. So let's think about emphysema now. Features of emphysema, <clears throat> as we've said, increased size of air spaces, distension and damage of the lung tissue itself. This means that the surface area available for gaseous exchange is reduced, therefore you get decreased gas transfer. The lungs no longer work as efficiently as they did. People with emphysema are often uh, breathless uh, and may or may not be wheezy, but sometimes are wheezy. But they do tend to be breathless. And you get the loss of the elastic recoil of the lung. So again, it's making expiration harder because remember expiration is normally in a passive elastic recoil process. Now in the UK the main cause of emphysema is smoking and emphysema to spaces as we've actually seen on the pictures occur in 50% of smokers over the age of 60. So people that have smoked for some years half of them get emphysema. So um, there's a very, very, like, very real chance that a smoker will develop emphysema. 50-50 chance that will develop emphysema after the age of 60. In emphysema, there's use of the accessory muscles of respiration because of the difficulty in, uh, particularly in the difficulty in breathing out. And sometimes you see intercostal in drawing. Intercostal in drawing means that when the patient breathes in, that um, the, the um, spaces in between the ribs are sucked in. Intercostal muscle in drawing, it's really short for. 
And you, you see this in several uh, respiratory conditions. So intercostal enjoying sometimes occurs. Now let's think about the etiology. The main thing we've mentioned is cigarette smoking. But any smoky environment seems to be a factor and, and, and damp, wet conditions that paralyze the cilli seem to cause bronchitis and that seems to lead on to emphysema. But what's important to notice is that although bronchitis and emphysema go together in the same patient, it's not, it, it's not so much that the one is causing the other, though that probably does happen to a degree. It's because the etiology is the same. So cigarette smoking is, can cause bronchitis and cigarette smoking also causes the emphysema by another direct effect on the alveoli, as we'll see. So etiology of emphysema. Epidemiologically, certainly cigarette smoking is well related, uh, sorry, the, the incidence of emphysema is well related to the number of cigarettes smoked. So a person is 20 times more likely to die from uh, a chronic obstructive airways disease if they smoke 30 cigarettes a day than non-smokers. So if a person smokes 30 cigarettes a day or more, they are 20 times more likely to die from COAD than a non-smoker. This graph we're going to look at illustrates the uh, correlation between number of cigarettes smoked and deaths from chronic obstructive airways disease. And we'll see there's a very good relationship. So I know this prints a bit small for you to see, but it says deaths related to number of cigarettes. And this axis here is the mortality uh, per 100,000. And along the bottom axis here, there's number of cigarettes smoked per day. So people that don't smoke any cigarettes, there's three per 100,000 die uh, per year from chronic obstructive airways disease. Those that smoke one to 14 cigarettes a day, the mortality goes up to 51. Those that smoke 15 to 24, the mortality goes up to 78 per 100,000. And those that smoke more than 25 cigarettes a day, the mortality shoots right up to 114. So you've got the non-smoker here, and you've got the heavy smoker here at 25 a day or more, and you can see the difference in the mortality figures between those two cases. And finally, uh, this, this, this column here is ex-smokers, uh, and their mortality drops to 44. So significant benefit in mortality if your patients stop smoking. But we see there's a definite correlation between the number of cigarettes smoked and the mortality from the chronic obstructive airways diseases. Now let's think about why, why smoking causes emphysema. Well, in the lungs of smokers, there's more granulocytic white blood cells. And um, I'm not quite sure what happens here, but I think what happens is the granulocytes secrete an enzyme called uh, serotonin elas elastase. Serotonin elastase. The A tells, tells you it's an enzyme. And this is an enzyme which actually breaks down, which actually digests, really, elastic tissue. So the smoking increases the number, of, the smoking, first of all, increases the number of granulocytes. As I understand it, the granulocytes secrete serine elastase, which is an enzyme. And this enzyme is protolytic and breaks down elastic tissue. So the granulocytes secrete the serine elastase. The serine elastase breaks down elastic tissue. And of course, um, because the lungs are elastic structures, it means that um, there's elastic tissue in the walls of the alveoli, and that's actually broken down. So their destruction is, is a direct effect of the presence of the smoke mediated through the granulocytes and the serine elastase and the protolysis of the elastic tissue. Smoking also causes mucous gland hypertrophy as a result of persistent irritation, but that's more a factor of uh, feature of bronchitis rather than emphysema, actually. So you get chronic uh, high levels of uh, viscous uh, mucus in people with chronic obstructive airways disease. And air pollution. 
Now, in many third world cities where the incidence of um, bronchitis and emphysema is increasing, the air pollution is, is particularly bad. And um, there's an increased mortality during periods of increased pollution, for example, in smogs, when you get fog and, uh, and smoke, you get increased mortality. So air pollution, uh, epidemiologically at least, is a factor in mortality and it is almost certainly a factor in, in etiology. And of course, occupational exposure, people that work in smoky environments, more likely to develop um, bronchitis and emphysema. Now briefly, other factors that might be involved, some patients might be allergic to things which are causing uh, bronchitis and emphysema. Autoimmunity may play a factor. If a person develops antibodies to the, any tissue in the alveoli, that could cause destruction of the alveoli and emphysema. And of course, as with all diseases, almost certainly, although we don't know a specific gene as yet, there probably is genetic predispositions. These conditions do tend to, uh, well, all medical conditions to some degree tend to run in families. Of course, the question is whether that is, is nature or nurture, whether it's uh, genetic or whether it's the way families live. And the condition becomes more common with ageing because the older you are, the more opportunity you've had to, um, to inhale uh, smoke and other, other pollutants. Now, a major factor in bronchitis and emphysema are, is, is, are infections. Now, infections... The chronic infection, as we've mentioned, can cause scarring of the bronchial passages due to uh, inflammation, damage to the tissue and healing. And as well as that, there can be acute uh, infections, uh, exacerbations of chronic bronchitis from acute infections. Because, of course, infections are much more likely to occur in the damaged lung, as we saw in that x-ray, in fact, where there was lobal consolidation. So very often when these patients come into hospital, they're suffering from an acute infection and we refer to it as an exacerbation of chronic bronchitis. The chronic bronchitis has become worse because of the inflammatory effects of an acute infection. And this, the, the, these infections we can treat, often fairly readily with antibiotics, and the patient's condition can improve quite markedly, often, often fairly quickly, with uh, antibiotics and other nursing measures that we'll look at later on. So let's think about infections now. Infections in bronchitis and emphysema. Infections often cause exacerbation of chronic disease. Exacerbation of chronic. But of course, infections are often chronic in themselves. Uh, these patients often have a degree of bronchial infection all the time and are constantly producing uh, green and yellow coloured uh, sputum to a degree. So chronic infection may be present. Many different pathogens, opportunistic organisms can cause exacerbations. But commonly, pneumococcus, the streptococcus pneumoniae, is an etiological organism in acute exacerbations. Antimophilus influ influenza is another, another common organism. And of course, these repeated infections have a role, uh, certainly, my, I understand they certainly have a role in etiology. Infection causing inflammation, resulting in some scar tissue, and it's a downward, vicious, degenerative uh, process. Now, just a couple things left to do on this topic now. First of all, we'll look at prevention, and then we'll look at nursing management. Now, clearly, it's much better to prevent than to manage the condition. So how can we prevent it? Well, the most obvious thing that we've talked about is smoking, isn't it? Don't smoke and avoid smoky environments. So identify in a particular patient what the main etiological factor is and then try and avoid that factor. Now, if, some, if it's a smoky environment that's the problem, it's often quite difficult. As we said before, particularly people in uh, poor areas who have to have wood fires to cook on, it's very difficult to try and avoid the smoke because it's sometimes cold outside and you, or you can't go outside. But where possible, when you're cooking on open wood fires, uh, cook outside. 
especially for children, try and keep the children away from the smoke as much as you can. And of course, don't smoke cigarettes. Uh, I think they're the main, the main, the main avoid avoidance advices. But let, let's go through it on the notes and think about it logically. Prevention of bronchitis. So identify and avoid respiratory irritants, whatever they might be. A bit like in asthma, really. You know, if you're allergic to hamsters, don't keep hamsters. If you're allergic to horses, don't go horse riding. So identify and avoid respiratory irritants. And I'm not said bronchitis is a smoker's disease. It, it's not entirely true, but it's largely true. Dust, smoke, of course, infections. Uh, recognise an early treatment of infections. An occupational exposure may even mean that some people, unfortunately, have to think about a change of, of occupation. Avoid going out in cold, foggy weather. Um, cold weather tends to paralyse the cilli, so they can't waft up the uh, mucus anymore and infection becomes more likely, therefore bronchitis, therefore scarring. Foggy weather, the damp coldness seems to be a factor. Um, I don't know what it is, w w w whether again it's an effect on the cilli or whether it inflames the uh, mucous membranes of the respiratory tract directly, or whether it's the fact that bacteria uh, can be inhaled uh, adherent to uh, foggy uh, water particles. Avoid infected uh, people uh, that an infection may be caught from. And avoid crowds in the influenza season. And this is a fairly uh, major factor, in fact. Uh, we, we said before that chest infections often occur after viral infections. And exacerbations of chest infections, uh, of chronic bronchitis and emphysema, often occur after uh, viral infections. And in fact, this is why we often immunise people with chronic bronchitis against influenza before the influenza season starts. If we can avoid an attack of influenza, a respiratory virus, then hopefully we can avoid an exacerbation of chronic bronchitis with secondary bacterial infection. That is bacterial infection secondary to the viral infection. When infections are identified, they should be treated promptly with antibiotics to prevent them becoming established. And of course, if you treat the infections early, you're going to reduce the inflammatory effect of those infections on the bronchial tree. An early disease, that is early chronic bronchitis and emphysema, seems to predominantly affect the smaller airways and does seem to be reversible. So if someone is smoking, then the disease that they're suffering from may be partly or indeed wholly, if it's an early stage, reversible. So tremendous advantage in identifying and avoiding the respiratory irritant. Let's carry straight on and think about a couple of complications. Well, of course, respiratory failure. The lungs are physically no longer able to facilitate gaseous exchange. That means the partial pressure of oxygen in the, in the blood will be reduced. P stands for partial pressure in this context, PO2, will be reduced. In other words, the patient will uh, have hypoxemia and subsequent hypoxia of tissues. And the level of CO2 in the blood will rise because the lungs also, as well as absorbing oxygen, are responsible for the excretion of CO2. So respiratory failure low oxygen, high CO2. And as we mentioned, corpulmonale, heart disease secondary to uh, lung disease. We'll just run through this briefly as we've already done it. Pulmonary hypertension, corpulmonale. Hypoxemia leads to pulmonary artery, arterial vasoconstriction. That increases the pressure in the pulmonary artery that means the right ventricle has to work harder. Therefore, right ventricular hypertrophy occurs. Right ventricular hypertrophy will lead to right ventricular failure. And that will dam back, as we saw before, causing a systemic edema. The pressure on the right side of the heart can mean that tricuspid incompetence may develop. 
and this, uh, this will cause raised jugular venous pressure and may cause ascites, a, a um, collection of fluid in the abdomen. And of course the uh, systemic congestion will mean that uh, the, the organs, the major organs can become congested. For example, the liver may become uncomfortable due to swelling. So complications of uh, core pulmonale. Now the clinical picture, as we've already discussed in chronic bronchitis and emphysema, is usually uh, fairly obvious. But we've discussed that in detail, so I won't go over that now. But let's think about specific investigations that may be carried out in hospital to uh, refine the diagnosis or to confirm the diagnosis. So investigations, well various lung function tests, peak flows and spirometry and things like that may be carried out. And of course chest x-ray will show the overinflated flattened diaphragm uh, picture that we saw before. Blood tests, well there's possible rises in haemoglobin and uh, packed cell volume. Actually, I can't remember whether I told you about this before, but I'll mention it again here anyway. Because the patients are chronically hypoxic, then uh, this is detected in the kidney, and the kidney will secrete more erythropoietin. Because erythropoietin is stimulated, the, the release of erythropoietin is stimulated by oxygen lack. The erythropoietin will then stimulate the red bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. So that's going to increase the amount of red blood cells in the circulatory system. So there may well be an increase in haemoglobin because haemoglobin of course is, is uh, present in red blood cells and the percentage of the blood which is cells may be increased, the packed cell volume. I think that's probably the same thing as hematocrit actually, we used to call it hematocrit. It's the percentage of the blood which is, is cells anyway. Blood gas analysis may be carried out to determine blood, uh, arterial blood chemistry. This is carried out on arterial blood and gives you such things as the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide and, and several other things uh, in the arterial blood. Sputum, of course, um, well, routine observation of sputum is important, volume, consistency. But as well as that, it would uh, normally be cultured to identify any specific bacteria which may be causing problems. It's always worth doing an ECG to check on cardiac uh, things that might be involved. Um, for example, the core pulmonale or, or, or coexisting coronary heart disease or something. But you should see, I think you should see um, the, the, the right ventricular hypertrophy on the, on the ECG. And uh, alpha-1, that should be an alpha there. Alpha-1 antitrypsin disorder. I'm not going to talk about that now. Uh, it's a genetic and it can be a possible cause of emphysema. But let's go on now and think about the nursing interventions. And if you understand the disease, then I find that the nursing interventions are usually fairly obvious, but we're going to run through them and specify them. And uh, try and, as you, go, as you watch this part of the video, maybe try and list the problems specifically so that you can make a care plan up. Uh, for, for, from the nursing interventions and the problems we're going to identify. So let's think about nursing interventions then in bronchitis and emphysema. We need to eliminate the pulmonary irritants. So that means that there should be no smoking. Patients should be advised to avoid air pollutants and outside activity in polluted air. Now I think you can see that if you're physically active in polluted air, you're going to be inhaling more of the polluted air in and out of your lungs. So if someone does have to be in an environment where the air is polluted, they shouldn't be exercising as well, because if they're exercising, they'll be hyperventilating on the polluted air and increasing the amount of pollutants that are inhaled into their lungs. So avoid exercise, well avoid polluted air if you can entirely, but certainly avoid uh, exercise in polluted air to minimise the amount of pollutants inhaled. So avoid air pollutants and outside activity in polluted air. House dust may be a factor, this is more for asthma, but um, 
might be worth thinking about house dust. And use of home humidification can prevent secretions drying up, therefore aid the, the expectoration. Oh, that was really health promotion, that part. Let's think about management particularly. And the first thing is nursing observations. What nursing observations will we carry out? Well, we need to observe for the level of dyspnea, the, le the level of difficulty in breathing. How difficult is the patient finding it to breathe? How distressed are they by their difficulty in breathing? We should observe for the level of cyanosis. Is it peripheral? Is it central? How bad is it? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? And the mental state may be a guide to the level of hypoxemia because it might be a guide to the level of cerebral hypoxia. So if the patient's confused and disorientated, very bad sign because it might mean that the brain is becoming hypoxic. We need to observe temperature because that's going to tell us whether there's an acute uh, infection present. Pulse is an important indicator anyway. And of course, uh, respiratory rate is, is, is clearly what the nature of the condition is about. So regular TPR observation, as with any ill patient. And regular weight. Think about it. Why do we want to assess regularly any change in weight of these individuals? Well, if there's corpulmonale and right-sided heart failure, secondary to bronchitis, then systemic edema will de be developing, and that means that the person will be retaining more fluid. And of course, a litre of water weighs a kilogram. So if the patient's putting on weight, it may mean they are acutely retaining fluid, which is a, a fairly dangerous, uh, potentially, potentially dangerous situation, which can possibly be treated with diuretics and, uh, and other things like that, as, as well as hopefully treating the, uh, the cause of the, the, the fluid retention. So daily weight, another, or regular weight anyway, another important nursing observation. Now the next part, of, well, I put treat blood gas abnormal. It's a bit of a complicated way to put it, really. It really means um, do something about the fact that the patient is hypoxic. Try and restore the amount of oxygen in the blood. So hypoxemia can be treated with low concentrations of oxygen. This should be humidified oxygen to keep the secretions moist because remember dry oxygen will dry up the secretions. And the percentage given should not exceed 24%. But if 24% oxygen is given to someone with chronic obstructive airways disease, that can be a significant benefit. It can help them a lot. And there's a couple, important th couple of important points to make here. Now, the air that we're breathing in from the atmosphere contains about 20% oxygen. So you would think that to give 24% oxygen, that's just to enrich it by 4%, wouldn't make much difference. Just another 4%. But it does make a big difference. It makes a big difference the amount of oxygen that the haemoglobin in the blood absorbs. It increases it significantly. The reason is that it's because the haemoglobin curve at those oxygen concentrations is very steep. Don't worry if you don't understand that. Just take my word for it that a little bit of extra oxygen can make a big difference to, to the patient's uh, blood oxygen level. So it's well worth doing. So why don't we give them 50% oxygen? Do you know why you don't give people with chronic obstructive airways disease high concentrations of oxygen? Just think about that for a minute. Well, it's very important that in chronic obstructive airways disease, we don't exceed 24% oxygen unless the doctors say specifically that we can. And even then, we'd have to observe them very carefully. And the reason is that if you don't have lung disease, in you and me, hopefully, if we're healthy, then the reason that we're breathing 
is not because the amount of oxygen in our blood falls. What stimulates our respiration is because the amount of carbon dioxide in our blood rises. So it's high levels of CO2 that stimulate respiration rather than lack of oxygen. However, in people with chronic obstructive airways disease, particularly uh, patients with predominant bronchitic type disease, they can't <coughs> exhale the carbon dioxide from the lungs and it collects in the lungs. So you get a collection of carbon dioxide in the lungs because they can't exhale it properly. That means the level of carbon dioxide in the blood increases. And the respiratory centre in the medulla oblongata of the brain, in the brain stem, gets used to having a high level of carbon dioxide. And this high level of carbon dioxide actually overwhelms the normal uh, hypercapneic, the normal high carbon dioxide respiratory drive mechanism. So that no longer works. So in other words, people with chronic obstructive airways disease, particularly the bronchitis type, don't breathe like you and me from carbon dioxide excess. That mechanism, that mechanism has been overwhelmed by chronically high levels of carbon dioxide. So the CO2 excess stimulating mechanism no longer works. So wh why do these people breathe? Well, the reason is that we have a backup system. And that backup system stimulates respiration by oxygen lack. By oxygen lack. So the reason someone with chronic obstructive airways disease is breathing is not like you and me because the levels of carbon dioxide are high, it's because the, the levels of oxygen in their blood uh, are low. So that's what's stimulating their breathing. So if you give a wee bit more oxygen, like 24% oxygen, that's okay, that won't increase it too much. It'll, it'll help them a lot, but it won't increase it that dramatically. But if you give high concentrations of oxygen, then there's going to be a lot of oxygen in their blood, and what is it that makes these patients breathe? What did I say? The thing that makes them breathe is, is oxygen lack. And if you put lots of oxygen into their blood all of a sudden, then what's left to stimulate their breathing? Because there's no longer oxygen lack. Therefore, the breathing may reduce or even stop. So very important in COADs not to give high concentrations of oxygen because you can stop the patient breathing but 24% oxygen will be beneficial. So that's your rule of thumb, no more than 24% oxygen in chronic obstructive airways disease. Very important point. We want to avoid narcotics and sedatives, especially the opiates, because these can uh, reduce, uh, de depress the respiratory centre. And we want to nurse them sitting up because lung inflation is easier when you're sitting up than when you're lying down. So in management, we've mentioned observations. We've mentioned uh, getting more oxygen into the patient, treat blood gas abnormality. Next important aspect of nursing management is encourage expectoration. Now these patients have excessive mucus production and that mucus is often infected. So I think you can see if they didn't cough it up, if they didn't expectorate, it's going to clog, it's going to collect down in the lungs, it's going to be too much of it, it's going to start blocking off airways. Um, and, and, it, and, it's, and if it's static, the infection is not going to be cleared. So we need to clear it, to clear the infection, to cough the infections out and to keep the lungs clear from all this excessive mucus production. So maintaining expectoration is very important. Encouraging the patients to cough, giving them something to spit into, giving them humidified air or oxygen if necessary, 24% of course, if, um, if you're giving oxygen for any amount of time to stop these secretions from drying out, but keep them moist, keep them mobile, keep them coughed up. Keep the psilli working as much as you can by avoiding respiratory irritants and the chest will be altogether healthier by your encouraging expectoration. Something to spit into and make it easier for them to, uh, to expectorate mucus um, or this excessive mucus.
So encourage expectorations. Expectoration. The principles are secretions must be expelled for the reasons we've discussed. Coughing and deep breathing exercises can be beneficial in aiding expectoration. Liquid. Avoid systemic dehydration because in systemic dehydration, if the patients are dehydrated, then uh, the bronchial secretions will become drier as well. And if patients are having particularly, particular problems with dry, clogging up mucus, steam inhalation m may be beneficial. So uh, three points there in keeping secretions liquid. Avoid dehydration, use humidification and uh, steam inhalation if you consider it necessary. Postural drainage and even percussion with the aid of physiotherapists may be beneficial, particularly if there's uh, any lobe or consolidation, you would want to try and clear that. So if a patient, for example, had some uh, right lobe or consolidation, you would lie them on the left-hand side, so that allows the lung to drain downhill because they're now on the, on the side. And you might, uh, physio physiotherapists especially are very good at, when the patient exhales, they do this on the side of the chest and that seems to shake the mucus free and the patient can then, then cough it up. But no reason why we shouldn't learn to do that from the physiotherapists as well. So drainage, actually percussion is not the real term, it's shaking I really mean. Although percussion, if it helps the patient, is, is acceptable. This will encourage the patient to cough, give them something to spit into, give them tissues, all that sort of thing. And of course, our colleagues, physiotherapists, are particularly useful uh, to, to aid this sort of activity. So we've said observation, we've said treat blood gas or, ma or ab abnormality, we've said encourage expectoration. Let's now go and look at how we prevent infection. So we need to identify, if possible, prevent and treat infections. Early identification is going to make treatment easier and prevent damage from that infection. In prevention, remember we said we maybe uh, immunise them against viruses which will make subsequent secondary bacterial infection less likely. So early recognition, well first of all prevention, early recognition and treatment of infection, early detection, culture and sensitivity, so antibiotic ther therapy can be specified to the particular agent, and prevention of cross-infection from other potentially infected people. So in nursing management, we've mentioned observation, we've mentioned treat blood gas, or malati, uh, blood gas abnormality, we've mentioned encourage expectoration, we've discussed prevent treat infection. Let's think about some general measures now. While these patients, because they're very ill and breathless, might need help with their activities of daily living, for example, personal hygiene. And uh, mouth care is quite important as well to keep the mouths uh, clean and fresh. And we do this with a toothbrush and toothpaste. Nutrition, as in any illness, is important. How can your patients recover if they're malnourished? So pay attention to nutrition. Small, fairly regular, attractively presented, nutritious meals. However, if the patients are obese, that is going to make the condition worse uh, and that should be countered with a, with a reduced calorie diet and when the patient is able to, uh, increased exercise. So regular small meals are important for nutrition, but a large meal will put a lot of pressure on the diaphragm and may inhibit respiration. So regular small meals to reduce the pressure that a large meal would put on the diaphragm. Because remember, the stomach's just under the diaphragm. And when you inhale, it's got to move the stomach down a bit. Build in rest periods into your patient's day. Constant coughing can be very tiring, so rest is important. And keep the patients as fit as the condition will allow. So when the patients are able to, regular exercise is important to keep the patients as fit as possible. So in nursing management, we've looked at observation. We've looked at treat blood gas abnormality. We've looked at encourage expectoration. We've looked at prevent treat infection. We've looked at general measures.
Let's think about a few aspects of psychological support. Breathlessness, remember, is very frightening. If the patient feels they're suffocating and can't breathe, it's very frightening, and panic attacks even are, are possible. So remember, your patients can be very anxious if they feel they can't breathe properly. In established disease, patients often need to come to terms with the chronic nature of the disease. Now, certainly we can optimise the disease, but in some patients it's not going to go away and they need to come to terms with that uh, to try and live with it. That's a, a psychological adjustment, really. As with any cro chronic uh, or severe disease, possible anger and depression are, are not un infrequent uh, reactions. And again, we need to think about how we're going to manage anger uh, and possible depression. Family support, is all, as always, is important. Patients may see this condition as socially unacceptable as well because they're always coughing and spitting and things. So it's important that the family and friends support the individual. Now, patients make up every reason under the sun for, stopping smoke, for, for carrying on smoking. For example, they say that smoking helps them to cough the phlegm up and all sorts of rubbish like this. It isn't true. Tell them it's not true in, in logical terms and uh, do whatever you can to get the patients to stop smoking. So counter the patient's rationalisations for continued smoking and make them realise that stopping smoking is, in by f is, is certainly in their best interests. Bear in mind there might be em employment problems and the patient might be unable to work and all the socio-economic burdens that go with that. Especially a big problem in, in uh, people, younger people with this disease, um, this can have, uh, because, of, because of the commonness of the condition, it, it can induce quite a considerable socio-economic load. And this might especially be a problem in third world countries. So if you tell young men that they might not be able to support their wife and their children, in 10 years time that might be a good motivation for stopping smoking.